this is I am going to speak for about 20 to 30 minutes. We're talking today about attachment and attunement and uh, what you really need to know to bond with your baby. And so how it's gonna work, if you have a question at all while I'm talking, we're gonna have time at the end of the seminar to um, answer questions. So everyone has a chat. So if you can use your chat and chat in any questions um, as I'm going that come up and then I will try to answer as many as I can at the end. So um, just as we're, I guess, trying to get to know each other, a little bit. I can't hear you or see you. I know we've got 19 people there so far, so that's awesome. Um, and so if you can just um, chat, like maybe where you're from or when you're due, or um, if your baby's already here, how old they are, uh, just so I could kind of see where you guys are coming from. And then we're going to get started in just another minute. So, okay. Um, okay, oh, I'm getting some chats. Let's see some, um, I, okay. Oh, I'm getting a lot. Great, 37 weeks pregnant, 38 weeks from Long Island. I'm from Long Island initially. I've been in California for a very, very long time, but I actually grew up on Long Island. Great Cincinnati, Ohio, 16 weeks pregnant from Canada. Awesome. Great. So, oh, someone's due right after Christmas. Exciting. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Thank you for this. I, at least I feel like I'm talking to people. I know you're here. That's awesome. Okay. All right. We are going to get started. So, Okay, so we've got a lot of people who are expecting. Um, so the first thing I really love to talk about is expectations with bonding, because what happens a lot, which is really understandable, is that we all have this, well, not all of us, but most of us have this image in our head of the moment our baby comes into this world. And we are given that beautiful little baby to hold and all this amazing love is just going to pour right out of us. And we are going to feel this instantaneous, amazing bond like we've never felt before. And we are going to absolutely feel this protection and love and connection for this baby. Right? So that's what most of us are expecting. And yes, there are some people who do have that experience. And if you are one of them, that is wonderful. And that's, I, I love to hear that. And it's a terrific moment, but just as many people do not have that experience. Um, so maybe your pregnancy and delivery didn't go quite as you had planned. Uh, maybe you had a hard labor. Maybe there was a C-section that was unplanned. If you're a partner, maybe it was just really emotional seeing um, your partner go through labor or if they had a C-section, worrying about them. Um, and sometimes, you know what? Things could go pretty smoothly and then they hand you your baby and you're like looking at your baby and you're like, oh, okay, that's my baby. And you just kind of feel numb, it feels surreal. Um, you just don't feel much of anything. And that is actually normal. Sometimes it's just so much to take on that as a protective measure, our body sort of just numbs out, it detaches a little bit. And so what I want you to know is if that does happen to you or if that did happen to you, you are absolutely not alone. In fact, it happens to about half of the population. And that um, bonding is not reliant upon those first few minutes of life. Um, it is the day in, day out relationship that you are going to form with your baby. So if we're feeling guilty or if we're giving ourselves negative messages, like this means I'm not cut out for parenting, um, 
I can't believe I didn't feel what I was supposed to feel. Uh, please allow yourself the grace to know that that's actually a very normal experience. And that over time, as you build this relationship, this bond between you and your baby will form. Your baby is getting to know you just as much as you're getting to know your baby. It is not all upon you to bond with your baby. It's about having a relationship. When you have any relationships in your life, it's not only on one person to connect to the other, it's that give and take, it's that learning about each other, it's about learning each other's signals and gestures and and, and uh, how they communicate. And so this all takes time to develop. So I want to talk for just a little bit because we could have like a whole lecture series on attachment theory, but I do want to talk just about sort of the heart of attachment theory, um, where it came from and what we, what the biggest takeaway message was from it. So attachment theory um, is, is mostly based on the work of a theorist named John Bowlby. And then Mary Ainsworth came along later and did some more studies, but we're not going to even go into that. We're just going to focus on John Bowlby in the 1950s. He did a lot of research on how human beings attach, how babies form a secure bond. And so one of his biggest studies that has um, that sort of made the, the most movement was he looked in, at residential hospitals where babies and toddlers were kept when their mothers were in hospital. And so what they did, they would never even do this today, but this is back in the 50s, was the toddler was in a hospital uh, as the mom was seeking treatment and the toddler was being fed and, you know, talk to diaper change, et cetera, but not by anybody that the toddler knew and not by somebody that was really able to be there consistently forming a relationship with the toddler. So, you know, these were nurses, they would come in, they would, you know, check in, they would, you know, make sure the the child was fed and you know was well warm and um, diaper was changed, et cetera. And the nurse would spend a little bit of time talking to the toddler, but then they would leave and then another shift would happen and another nurse would come. And, and so what they found was even though all the toddler's needs were being met, the toddler was becoming initially more and more upset with each interaction. Every time a nurse would try to connect or talk to the toddler, the toddler would get more and more upset, um, crying for their mother. And then over time, the toddler got depressed and would just sort of turn away and not even try to communicate and eventually would just detach. And when they um, finally had the toddlers reunite with the moms, they found that, that, that they were super, super clingy for a very long time. And this actually had a long-term effect. Um, I don't know how long the study went, but they said it wasn't just like, okay, they were back. Like the toddler remembered this experience and really was affected by it. And so what came out of this work was really his understanding that uh, through his observation that uh, human beings are hardwired for connection. A child needs to have a continuous and predictable relationship with his or her parent or caregiver to thrive emotionally. So the theory says that the parent-child bond is the essential bond for infant development. And he made three main points. He said, first, in order to have a secure bond, a parent has to be available and responsive to their child. So that's that relationship we were talking about. The child needs to feel that this person is there and is there to read their cues and meet their needs and that they can trust this person and that they are getting to understand this person just as this person is getting to understand them. Second, he came to the conclusion that this first relationship is sort of the basis in which all other relationships follow. So he felt that if you had a secure bond with your child, then your child would thrive 
um, with a healthy sense of self-esteem for future relationships. If there was an insecure bond in childhood, then it would be more difficult for a uh, adult, to, uh, as an adult, for that adult to make healthy choices in relationships. And then thirdly, he said that the confidence that a child feels is built on experience. So it's built on um, needing that um, help to survive, getting it, um, knowing that a parent was coming, that someone was there to attend to them, to read their cues, to respond to them appropriately. So when the child built that sense of trust, then that child built an inner sense of self-confidence. So then that child would be able to go out into the world and be independent and self-sufficient and resilient. So that first relationship in knowing that availability in trusting that someone was there for them in the world is what enabled them to then have a good sense of self later on. So um, this sounds really good, I think, in many ways, but I also think it can sometimes feel like a lot of pressure because it. what I get asked when I do my uh, parent in me classes, oh, and I just realized I never introduced myself. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So I'm going to do that in one second. Uh, but what I get asked in my parent and me question, uh, uh, classes is, you know, well, what if I don't always respond to my baby's needs? What if I, I don't know what a cue is? I don't read it correctly. Or what if my baby's crying and I'm, you know, in the shower or something and I can't get there right away? Is that going to forever teach my child that? They don't have somebody who understands them and, and, and is there for them. And so, of course not. Of course not. That is not what that means. So I'm going to just take a step back. I feel so silly, but I think um, in coming on a little late because I couldn't get on, I completely forgot to introduce myself. So let me take a minute to do that. Um, hello, everyone. I am um, Dr. Jill Campbell. I am a licensed psychologist who specializes in a maternal mental health, parenting, and early childhood development. And I am the curriculum director at the Pump Station and Nurtury. The Pump Station and Nurtury is a retail store and parenting center. We have it all. We have all your baby needs. We also have all the services and classes. And so um, we are located in Santa Monica. California and we have this amazing parent and me program. And so one of the things we talk about in the program is attachment and bonding. So I'm so sorry, I forgot to say that. Please, please, please forgive me. Okay, so now that I said that, let me go back to what I was saying. It does not mean when uh, Bowlby talked about needing this person who was gonna read their baby's cues for the baby to feel a secure attachment bond in the world. It does not mean that you have to get the cues right all the time. That is impossible. And what research has since showed us is what's way more important than always getting it right is just showing up, is just being present. And in time, we are gonna learn more. And today we are gonna talk about a few things to hopefully help. Um, but if you get the cues right about one third of the time, you are doing an awesome job. Okay, so you do not have to get it right all the time. It's more about showing up. So then I say that, and then you're like, well, what about in the moments that I can't show up? Do I have to be there 24 seven? I'm planning on going back to work. What is that gonna be like? So again, it's a sort of generalized sense of being present. It's more about when you're there that you're really um, able to give your child your conscious um, ability to listen, to be calm, to respond. It's not about you having to be there physically 24-7. Um, if you are at work, you will probably have your partner there, or you will have a nanny, or a daycare, or um, grandparent. And this will be somebody else who's going to form a bond with your child as well. So of course, parenting, parents are forming that really close, um, special attachment bond. But then 
a grandparent, a daycare center, uh, where there's the same people they see every day or a nanny, they're gonna form a secondary bond to your baby, which is very different than in these studies where these nurses were rotating and we're not getting to know these children. So it is actually good for your child to have a, a community of people that they can get to know and understand because then they feel like the world is a bigger, safer place. Okay, so um, can we sometimes let our babies cry? So this comes up a lot too, right? Because we're talking about, well, meeting their cues and meeting their cues and meeting their needs and, and letting them know somebody's there. So yes, that is our goal. We are trying as best we can to do that, but we are not gonna be able to do that all the time. And the fact is that these little bits of time that a baby can that a baby cries either because we're there and we just don't know what to do to help um, or because maybe like we're in the car and our baby's in the back seat or we're in the showers I mentioned before and we're, our hair is full of shampoo and our baby cries and fusses for a little bit of time until we can get to them. What might happen is your baby might in those little bits of time figure out how to self-regulate. They might start sucking on their fingers. They might look at a ceiling fan. They might move their legs a little bit. And so those little bits of time where they have that ability to learn how to self-regulate is going to grow. And so you are not going to um, spoil your baby by picking them up and helping them every minute. And you are not going to teach your baby that nobody's there for them and they're gonna have an insecure bond if you allow your baby at time to time, uh, from time to time to try to self-regulate, uh, whether because you're just watching and observing to see if they could do it and you're giving it a few minutes or you literally can't get to them every second. It's all okay. Babies are much more resilient than that. We're talking about this general relationship that we're forming with our babies. Okay, so um, I want to talk about um, a term called primary maternal preoccupation. So we're going back to the 1950s again to an analyst named D.W. Winnicott who studied mommies and infants. And I know this is like geared toward the mom, but please look at it as the parent and dads absolutely need to be bonding too. And we could have two dads and that's all great as well. So the research kind of focuses on the mom, but I really want you to reframe it as just the parent, right? So um, he talked about that um, starting uh, actually even before birth and then the first few months of life, parents go through what they call primary maternal preoccupation. Now, if you're carrying the baby, there is a little bit of a difference in that because of the hormones that happen while you're um, you know, carrying a baby that actually wire your brain for sort of being on high alert and paying attention. And so when a baby is first born, um, we're kind of zoned in on baby. And so that time period allows us to read our baby's cues, um, to kind of pay a, lo you know, a lot of attention and everything else for a while seems to fade into the background. And then when we're holding our baby and touching our baby, our hormone um, and chemicals of oxytocin kick in and oxytocin is sort of that bonding chemical. And so that kicks in. And so then we have our high alert and we have our bonding chemical. So for dads out there, you can produce oxytocin bonding chemicals as well. This is not, you know, reserved only for mommy. You might not have that same quite high alert feel initially, but you absolutely can get that by just zoning in and paying attention to your baby. And every time you do that and you hold your baby, you touch your baby and you look in your baby's eyes, that oxytocin, that love chemical is going to, um, elicit and it's going to bond you with your baby. So um, super important. But this primary maternal preoccupation helps us to bond, but it also kind of is, it takes us through a time where 
everything else um, is sort of pushed aside. And so sometimes we um, aren't interested in a lot of other things for a while. And then he says we kind of recover from that. And it doesn't mean we're not going to pay attention to our babies after that, but that um, we can't live forever as a parent completely zoned in on our child and not zoned in on any of the other parts of ourselves, right? So our career, our, you know, our partnerships, our um, family members, our friends, right? All those people are important. All our other roles are important. But at the beginning, you might be feeling like kind of all that's pushed aside and I'm just so so zoned in on baby. So to know that's that's normal, but it will probably also leave you feeling a little bit anxious at the beginning because it does sort of put you on high alert. Um, and so last thing I'm going to say about D.W. Winnicott is he also came up with the term, which is super important, called the good enough parent. So what he said is, yes, we go through this primary maternal preoccupation state. We zone in on baby initially. It helps us to read their cues. It does start to fade, um, but that our role is not to always be able to read every cue. Our role is not to be able to parent perfectly, that what our child really needs from us is the good enough parent. They need a parent that can be responsive and can show up and be there, but not always get it right. If we got it right all the time, every single thing, then in time, that's actually a lot of pressure to put on our children, right? We don't wanna to model to our children that they have to be perfect because they have a perfect parent who knows how to meet everybody's needs perfectly all the time. What's really more healthy is to show your child that you show up, but sometimes you make mistakes and sometimes you don't read cues right or you don't get things right. And then you can come back and you can repair and the relationship is still solid and you can talk about it and communicate and that attachment is still very much there. So again, attachment and secure bond bonding don't require you to read every cue right or to be the perfect parent and know what you're doing all the time. So please take that in. Okay, so let's talk about um, um, some tools for bonding. So the biggest tool um, that I like to talk about is just skin to skin touching, just holding your baby Right, so mamas who are breastfeeding are gonna get a lot of this, which is wonderful and terrific. If you're not breastfeeding though, holding your baby and giving your baby a bottle and maybe just having the skin to skin touch. Again, like I said before, if you're a daddy, you can have baby on your chest, just even holding their hand, having them on you. But when you can have that skin to skin, um, we know that, that that research shows that that helps with better regulation of arousal, lower stress level, and baby, more organized sleep cycles, longer periods of restful sleep, and overall calmness in young infants. So initially that skin to skin, uh, whether it be mommy or daddy, is going to be really helpful and beneficial for bonding. And again, like we said, it's one of the things that really helps your oxytocin levels rise. And that's that bonding chemical, that bonding hormone that makes you fall in love with your baby. Okay, second, eye to eye contact. Babies can see about eight to 10 inches in focus when they're first born, which is actually just sort of the distance between you and your baby if you're holding your baby. So babies love to stare at your face. They love to look at your expression. They're communicating right away um, in, in that eye contact. And babies, you will never win a staring contest with the baby. <laughs> they just stare. So having this eye to eye contact where you can just just be present and focused in on your baby and just study each other's faces is really going to help them to communicate and feel close to you and help you to feel close and bonded to your baby. The third one is mirroring. So babies are born with these mirror neurons. So we naturally, like when we're making that eye to eye contact, if a baby makes a face, well, we might imitate and mirror that face. If the baby has gas and smiles, we might smile back, tilt our head. So this kind of mirroring uh, we know actually helps 
uh, babies to build physical, social, and cognitive skills. So it's a really great way to bond with your baby. It's just thinking in terms of mirroring back what they're giving you, imitating back. It's also wonderful for language development as they start making sounds to kind of imitate and mirror back their sounds. Babies have the ability to imitate within 18 hours after being born. So even like that second day of life, you can try like sticking your tongue out when your baby's making that eye contact with you and you might actually see your baby imitate and stick their tongue out at you really early on. So mirroring your baby. We also talk about narrating to your baby. So narrating is a wonderful tool for language development in that if I'm sort of pointing out like, oh, look, there's a dog, we're on a walk, look at the trees. Oh, do you feel the air? We're talking to our baby, we're narrating what we're doing, we're narrating what we're saying, wonderful tool for language development. But it's also a wonderful tool for bonding and attachment. We. Um, I always say when you don't just, narrating is great, but also ask questions. So when you go to change your baby's diaper, maybe you say, oh, how does that feel getting a clean diaper put on? Oh, we could feel the air on your body. Do you like that? And then pause and wait for an answer. Now your little newborn baby is not gonna go, oh yes, thank you, mommy, daddy, for changing my diaper. That feels much better. But they might look at you and tilt their head. And as they get to about six weeks, when we get that first smile, which is huge, everybody. When you get that first smile, you feel like, oh, look, we're connecting. Because before then, babies sometimes just look like they're staring blankly at you because they don't have the ability to smile yet. But I promise you they're not. They're taking it all in. And so you might get a sound or a smile eventually or some type of communication back. And so practicing narrating from the moment that, you know, you the earliest moments you can. Um, and we also know parents will report like, oh, if I talk about, like, I know you don't like getting in the car seat, but if I talk about, okay, we're gonna get in that car seat, are you ready? And they talk about that transition to the car seat, like, all right, we're buckling you in, here's the click that their babies tend to cry a lot less and they actually tend to participate more. So as much as you can, narrating, talking to your baby, asking questions, waiting for a response, that's gonna build that strong bond between you and your baby. Um, so uh, we talked about touch with skin to skin, also massage, massaging your baby is wonderful. We know that babies that are massaged cry less, they soothe faster, um, they sleep better and it helps relieve gas um, and colic a little bit from all the, the tummy stuff with the massage. So it's, it's wonderful. It also helps with body awareness. So a uh, touch uh, with skin to skin and also with massage. And then the last thing I wanna talk about uh, with, with uh, the bonding tools is that um, so much of bonding is just getting through the hard moments. It's about having a baby that's crying and they're not hungry and you don't know what they want and you're looking at them and you're talking to them and you're holding them and you just get through it. Um, it's a hard moment, but I've talked to so many parents that will say, once we get through that moment, I feel more of a connection. Like we got through this together. We're a team. We kind of figured this out. Um, and what happens a lot with new parents is that um, when baby starts to cry, especially if mom is breastfeeding, dads will be like, here, take the baby. Baby's crying. Uh, you know what to do. And then mom, because they are the ones doing it a lot, the baby does kind of calm and soothe in the mom's arms. But if your baby is not hungry um, and you're a dad, try to stick it out. You will find your own ways to soothe and calm. Maybe it's bouncing on the bouncy ball or swinging them or singing to them or shushing in their ear, um, but you will find your ways. So don't think in terms of handing baby off to mommy unless you really know that it's time for that baby to nurse. Okay, so we're gonna talk about next is uh, baby states of alertness. So I like to talk about this because it just gives you a little clue into sort of understanding your baby, maybe what direction to go in um, as far as what state they're in and what they might need from you. So um, we're going to talk about awake states and then sleep states. So the first awake state is the calm alert. 
So this is the state when baby's awake, but they're calm, their eyes are open. They usually are kind of dancing a little. They're making that eye contact with you, right? And this is when you can sing songs, you can do the little massage, you can talk to your baby and your baby's gonna take that in and engage with you. So it's a beautiful uh, state of alertness is that calm alert. But then they go into active alert. And active alert is when they start to kind of fuss, right? So they, they, they might get a little fussy, they might start stretching their body, they might arch. And so that means that there's, they need some kind of change. A lot of times parents go immediately to it means they're hungry. They might be hungry, but it could also be that they just, that they're tired. It could be that they're overstimulated. Um, it could be like they're bored and they, need, they want a, a different uh, scenery. Although babies don't really get super bored. So, um, but it might be like, okay, let's go out and get some fresh air. So thinking in terms of that, that uh, 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 doesn't necessarily mean they're hungry. It's, it, you know, think about, okay, when was the last time we Bed and is it time to feed? But um, thinking of it as just maybe what change and then tuning into, you know, what change you think your baby might be needing at that time. Um, and then there's crying. And once they're crying, they're upset. And then um, what we know when it, we talk about sleep is that the first um, sleep state is drowsy. And so if our baby goes into crying mode and they're tired, now they're overtired. And it's 10 times harder to get an overtired baby to sleep than a tired, drowsy baby. So in the state of drowsy, we're gonna look for like little red um, uh, eyebrows or little red eyelids or a slight staring off or a yawn, or maybe they're looking in the other direction, not making that eye contact with you. So that state of drowsy before they go into crying is the best time to try to put them down for a nap or put them down at night. So a lot of times we wait until they're really crying and then we go, oh, they're tired, but it's 10 times harder to get an overtired baby who's crying to sleep than if you could catch them at that state of drowsy drowsy. So looking for those signs of drowsy. Then we have two states of sleep. There's quiet sleep and there's active sleep. So quiet sleep is non-REM sleep and their breathing is even. And that's that term sort of sleeping like a baby. They look peaceful. They look beautiful. They have even breathing. So we all look forward to that state of sleep. But there's also active sleep known as REM sleep. And when babies are in active REM sleep, they twitch, they make grunts, they're very noisy. So I like to have parents be aware of that because that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not sleeping, that they need to be fed, that they're upset. So know that babies are gonna cycle between quiet sleep and active sleep. And that active sleep, that REM sleep, they will twitch, their eyes will move back and forth underneath their eyelids, they'll grunt, um, they might kind of move their bodies a little bit, and that's a normal state of sleep. If they wake up and they cry, then they might be hungry, absolutely, but if they're asleep and they're kind of just making some grunting sounds, you know, pause and wait because there's a very good chance they're just in active sleep. Okay, so sounds that babies make. Let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, so sounds. So there is um, a woman named Pris Priscilla Dunstan, who is an opera singer, who studied the sounds that newborns make. And we do know from, she's not a, a linguist, but we do know from linguists that the fir first few months of life, babies make um, sounds that are reflexive. So they're coming more from their body. They're not most of the sounds they make initially are not from the language that they're hearing. They're more from what's happening in their body. So she studied it and she came up with this strong belief um, and, and she's done a lot of research on it. So I would definitely look her up if you're interested that those first few months, a lot of these reflective sounds tell you what your baby needs. So for instance, she says babies make a ne sound when they're hungry and eh sounds when they need to be burped and oh sounds when they're sleepy, a he sound when they're physically uncomfortable, like they're hot or cold or wet and an eh 
sound if they're gassy or need to poop. So I am not saying it's always gonna be easy to read these signs, but I do like it because in our classes, when we talk about it, I have had a lot of parents come back and say, I can't read all of them. I can't always understand them. And sometimes my baby goes into crying mode too fast. But if I'm listening and I'm paying attention, I usually can hear a few, a few of those sounds and it does guide me to know what is going on with my baby. So Priscilla Dunstan, baby reflex sounds, something to look into, gives you a little more of a cue as to how to read your baby's cues. Okay, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about are what are the tools to calm your baby? So probably a lot of you have already heard of this. Uh, we're gonna talk about Harvey Karp's Happiest Baby on the Block and the five S's to calming your baby. So um, the five S's we've been doing forever. We've been doing like centuries ago, but um, Harvey Karp um, in his writing, in his, in his work, The Happiest Baby on the Block, he talks about how when babies are first born, they're not really yet ready to be in the world. So he says they're, they're kind of like fetuses outside of the womb. And so everything is reflexive, like we just talked about with the sound reflexes. And, and so their hands, their fists are like this. And so they don't have a lot of ability to regulate their affect and arousal. So he said these five S's, which we've been doing forever, um, are the way to calm a baby. But what he noticed is that if a baby is really overstimulated and unconsolable, that doing all five together, you know, with pretty high intensity, often sets off the calming reflex. So just going to go over that quickly. We have swaddle. So if our babies are starting to get fussy, swaddling them, babies have the moro reflex. So when we put them on their backs, especially to sleep, their arms kind of go like this and it wakes them up or, or it keeps them from relaxing and calming. So when we swaddle a newborn baby, we're helping to negate that moro reflex and helping them to feel snug. And we say it almost like replicates being in the womb. Then a side position, which again, babies on their back. Babies usually don't like to be completely on their back. Um, so that's that moro reflex. So when we can put them on their side, when they're upset, they feel safer, they feel more secure. Shushing, shushing replicates um, the white noise sound. We know it's very noisy in the womb. And we also know that a shushing sound is, is white or pink noise. Shushing is actually, I believe, pink noise. But that white and pink noise like shushing, heartbeat, static sound, um, these sounds, the waves of the sounds help the brain to calm and aid in sleep. So sound machines or shushing in their ear um, really help a baby to relax and calm. They actually help adults as well. Um, those white noise and pink noise sounds helps us to sleep and calm. And then swinging. So that movement, that movement actually helps regulate whether we're swinging, whether we're sitting on a bouncy ball and bouncing. Um, that's all wonderful for helping a baby to calm and relax. And then the last one is sucking. So a lot of times um, we're going to have them sucking on a breast or a bottle um, as they're getting in warm milk, but also non-nutritive sucking can sometimes really help calm a baby. Just that sucking motion helps them to regulate. So whether it be your finger or a pacifier, so if your baby's upset and it's not time for them to eat, sucking on a pacifier or your finger, um, and then sometimes doing it all together will really set off that calming reflex. Okay, so the last part of good attachment is good communication. To build commu good communication, we want to be able to become present and empathic into our child's world. One of the tools I like parents to do from early on is every day, just take a few minutes, just, uh, just not much time at all, but imagine one activity that day through your baby's point of view. Try to imagine what it was like to be that your baby in that moment, whether it's giving them a bath or changing their diaper or going on a stroll or even just being in your arms and looking at you. Imagine what is it like for your baby to be looking up at your face and what are they seeing back? Um, we know that this is what helps us to kind of 
um, pause and to calm and to be empathic. And as soon as we can be empathic, we're gonna be more open, we're gonna be more curious, and it's gonna allow us to remain calm when we are trying to figure out our baby's cues. If we go into, well, what time did they eat? And what did they last do? And we start going through this whole list of questions in our head and panicking, our our cortisol levels will rise, we become stressed, we get flooded with stress hormones, and it's so much harder to read our baby's cues. When we can breathe, when we can take in um, a moment to be empathic, to be curious, to be open, we remain calm, and um, it's gonna be a lot easier for us to figure it out. But remember, you're not gonna figure it out all the time, that's okay. Um, baby just needs that relationship with you. Okay, guys, I know I went a little over. I'm going to check our chat and see if we can read some questions. So let me see. Um, okay, so I got I got, how early can you start baby massage? Um, you can start I have baby massage really early. Um, you don't initially need to use like oils and lotions, but just kind of doing like a little, if you could see like rubbing their tummy, kind of straight, you know, going down their arms. I'm not like an expert. We actually do have um, an expert named Barbara Zimmerman at the pump station who is a infant massage expert who can probably answer that question better than me, but simply like that touch and that little rub and massaging their belly and their legs and feet, you can do or, you know, very early on. Um, okay, I'm not seeing, let me see any other questions. Um, I have one here that came in before, so I'm going to read this one. And it says, um, I'm expecting due soon um, from friends who had their babies. I heard a lot about babies just want to be on mommy's chest, can only sleep there. So the question is, is this always good and how long for? Um, and how do I assure bonding can also take place with my partner? when I am the one naturally having more touch points. Okay, so um, so as far as baby sleeping on your chest, newborn babies often do like to sleep on your chest. It has your circadian rhythm, it has your smell. It's a, like we talked about, it's a wonderful way to bond. Um, they feel secure in the world. Nothing wrong with that. Um, eventually, uh, around somewhere around five to six weeks, babies developmentally go through their first sort of developmental leap with sleep where they start to organize day and night a little bit. And so um, what I sometimes suggest is if you're trying to promote longer stretches of sleep is that you might want to, if you see baby is falling asleep, you might want to put them down in their uh, bassinet um, to fall asleep there only because that if you hold them for sleeping always as time goes on, that becomes their sleep association. And so they think, oh, in order to sleep, um, it's, it's going to be in mommy daddy's arms for the entire nap. And if you want them to be able to sleep sometimes in their bassinet, if they could fall asleep, in their bassinet with maybe the white noise and swaddled up, then that becomes their sleep association. And so they start to associate those things with going to sleep. Now, if you say to me, you know what, I get it, but I love having my baby sleep on me. There is nothing wrong with that. It's beautiful and your baby will probably get a really long nap. But if eventually you start to feel like I would like to be able to sometimes put my baby down and have them nap in their bassinet so I have a little bit of me time, then starting to slowly practice when you see those signs of drowsy, putting them down, putting on the white noise, swaddling them up, um, then they will learn they can sleep in the bassinet as well as on you. So I hope that answers that question. 
and um, and to assure bonding for your partner. Um, I think I, I touched upon that. Um, skin to skin for daddy. Um, daddy taking care of baby, not handing baby back to mommy. And one other thing too, is if you are breastfeeding, usually in week, somewhere between week two to four, you can start giving your baby a pumped bottle of milk. And if you choose to do that, that can actually be where daddy gives that bottle. And so that daddy can have, you know, that time with baby to give like that one bottle a day. Um, also, if it's before you're pumping, and it's the middle of the night and a uh, baby needs to feed, maybe for one of those feedings, instead of mommy doing all the work, you can have daddy pick up the baby and bring the baby to mommy, let mommy feed so she could kind of stay in bed and maybe half asleep. And then daddy can be the one to burp the baby and change the baby's diaper and you know help that baby get back to sleep. And so that's a beautiful way that dads can not only really help out mom, but also really bond with their baby. Okay, oh, I got some more questions. So when is the best time to start reading books, stories to baby? Right away, immediately. Um, babies learn language. Babies are born with amazing sound perception. So right from the start with that they're born, they're listening and they're taking in shapes of sounds. So they don't know what they mean yet, but babies actually have better ability to distinguish idiosyncrasies of sounds than adults do. So they can hear like the difference between an English da and a Hindi da like profoundly, whereas we probably would not be able to hear the difference. So reading books is a great way when you read a book, you kind of, you know, like, like, like talk more dramatically, you make your voice go up and down, you pause, um, and babies really engage in that. So reading is a wonderful tool. What I don't love, surprisingly enough, is reading to your baby as a bedtime routine um, to transition your baby to sleep at night. So I love reading books for toddlers, for young children. They're mature enough, their, their brains are developed enough where they could snuggle in, listen to a story and relax. But for babies, reading is a stimulating, engaging, active activity. So um, I prefer to do it as a daytime activity when they're in that calm alert state and wait for a bit before you use it as a way to relax and get them sleepy and ready for bed. But uh, love reading to your baby um, right from the start. And um, what does going on a trip for say a week do in terms of attachment theory? When is it okay? to go on a trip without your baby. Okay, so um, yeah, so there's different opinions on this, but I what I think about when about when you're leaving your baby is where like where is baby going to be? So are we talking that we have two parents and one parent is going on a trip and the other parent's going to be home with the baby? Then in that situation, it should be absolutely fine. Baby's still with a parent who they're attached to. Um, they're still having their routine. They're still in their environment. If you're talking about a situation where um, maybe someone who doesn't spend as much time with the baby, you know, that's something you might want to prepare for more. So it might be, um, you know, once a baby um, is out of that fourth trimester, it might be about um, uh, doing a lot of connection with that person first. So if it's having them come over and visit or video chatting. Um, and, and so I would probably want the baby to be just a little bit older for that. So it really depends who is baby staying with um, and also how long are you going away? So if, is it a day or two? Is it a week or two? So a day or two, I think is, is definitely easier to do um, when they're younger. What's actually to your advantage is that babies don't have what we call separation anxiety um, until around that five to six month mark. So if you take a trip earlier on, 
um, actually babies have less separation anxiety then than when they're like six months and up. So, you know, it's really just according to everybody's situation and, and what's going to work for you. If you're saying, hey, I really need a couple of days for myself so I could come back and be the parent I want to be, um, then that's really important thing to keep in mind as well. Babies will reattach. They're not going to you're not gonna leave and they're gonna come back and say, who are you? Uh, we just want them to feel secure while you're away. But your relationship with them and their ability to reattach to you is super, super strong. I hope I answered that well. Okay, I'm gonna take one more question. Um, thoughts on scheduling out skin to skin time for daddy each day. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's wonderful. I love that idea. Um, I, I do really think that um, when you have a more traditional situation where, you know, mom's on maternity leave and dad's back working, um, that having a couple of baby activities that daddy's really responsible for is really helpful for daddy bonding with baby. So it might be, um, you know, that daddy always gives the bath or that daddy gets up um, in the morning and spends some time before going to work. So having some scheduled activities or certainly having some time where you say, hey, this time is your time with the baby for skin to skin bonding, for for however your baby's behaving, for helping them through a fussy period. You know, as long as you know that um, if it's a time, it could be like after mom nurses and you know you have a two hour um, time before baby needs to nurse again, then that time can be spent with daddy. So yeah, however it works, but I think it is helpful when you schedule something out in advance. Um, it's a lot of things don't just happen organically when you're in the midst of this time with your baby. So um, when you put things down on the calendar or you make a plan, you're much more likely to follow through because uh, there's just so much going on and everybody's doing so much. So having that schedule does really help. Okay, I'm gonna take one last question. Um, okay, thoughts on scheduling. What does the trip, is it disruptive? Okay, how might sleep training your baby impact on bonding and attachment experience? Okay, this is a very controversial, but um, I, I do teach um, uh, healthy sleep habits and um, how to help your baby to, uh, through the science of sleep, to sleep longer stretches on their own. I would never ever teach it if I thought it would affect your bond or your attachment with your baby. Everybody is different. Everybody is going to have a different way they want to do uh, nighttime with their baby. So some parents will, you know, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that baby be in the same room um, for at least the first six months, but they recommend them be in a co-sleeper next to the bed. So that's important for reducing the risk of SIDS. Um, now, some people say, well, I really end up with baby in bed with me a lot because I'm nursing and I like that. So there's a lot of information on how to set your bed up safely for baby. And if your bed is safe and you're enjoying that, um, that might be a wonderful bonding experience for you. If you're saying, you know what, I need my sleep, I am gonna be much more alert and focused and paying attention to my baby if my baby can learn to sleep more independently. And so if you work on some tools to be able to put them down and sleep in their bassinet or sleep in that crib, um, and you're doing it with responding to your baby, then baby is still going to be securely attached to you. Um, sleep training does not mean you have to put your baby in a room and close the door and not come back till morning. There's a lot of ways to slowly 
uh, allow them to figure out how to put themselves to sleep in a gentle way with responding to them, um, where it is not going to impinge upon your relationship or your bonding with your baby. Um, and again, we talked about bonding is, is not reliant upon baby never crying. So if you're doing something where, you know, babies may be fussing because they're figuring it out, but you're checking on them and you're rubbing them and you're doing in crib soothing, just the fact that baby maybe fusses for a bit as they're figuring out how to put themselves to sleep is not teaching your baby that nobody is there, right? You are still responding to your baby. So it's more about baby knowing that there's somebody there and available to them it's not about you as a parent always needing to stop the every single uh, bit of crying. You will not be able to. You can be holding your baby in your arms and bouncing them, and sometimes they're going to be crying because they're overstimulated or they're uh, release crying. And and so please don't think that that means you're not going to bond with your baby. So I hope I answered that. Okay, guys. We are up. Thank you so much. I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope you um, felt it was worthwhile. And um, I wish you a good night. Take care. Thank you.